Okay, so here we are on the remote terminal. I've got a browser open with the first page of Linux from scratch version 1.0, although interestingly, it hasn't got a version number there. It does actually appear, uh, I think, in the introduction. And on the right, I've got a terminal where we're going to copy and paste all the commands to. So the first thing I need to do is to uh, get into the remote PC or the computer where I'm going to build Linux from scratch 1.0. Now, because SSH isn't available on uh, SUSE 6.1, and because I don't believe it appeared or was available for several years, um, it means we can only access it remotely um, using some other method. And the method I'm going to be using is Telnet. Now, Telnet transmits information in the clear way. Nothing's encrypted. Um, it's not used at all these days it's always recommended to use ssh to connect connect machines together i use them on my own network but it's especially important if you're going out over a public network so in theory i could install a telnet client and connect directly to the machine but i probably i didn't like the idea of that because it's not secure despite the fact it's on my own network and also there's potentially the problem of versions even with the latest versions of OpenSSH, OpenSSL libraries um, there are older um, encryption techniques that are now um, well not even dec deprecated they're obsolete um, and they're not available so even if there was OpenSSH um, I can't remember what the obsoleted versions were now um, is it uh, let's see what this comes up with Oh yes, TLS, that's, that was one of them. I think TLS1 has been dropped, is that right? Um, well, anyway, so uh, like I say, there's, there's various problems with connecting. Um, so what I've decided to do, the Linux from scratch actually still does install a Telnet program. Um, and as the only machine I've got uh, that I, I still have that I use is um, that's a Linux from scratch machine is, is this server Pentium Pro or P Pro 200, which I'm using as my web server. Um, what I decided to do was to SSH into that. It's got um, LFS version 8 on there, so it's not the newest. Um, but that's a good thing as well, because if it was the newest, it may have the same issues. But because it's a slightly older version, it means I can um, SSH into it without having to worry about whether those older versions are available or not. Um, and also, by default, even the most modern... Um, Linux from scratch instructions include the installation of um, a Telnet client. So if I go to read online, right, okay, um, and I want to, no, sorry, download is what I want, that's why I'm not seeing that change. Go to the No Chunks, which is the complete book, so it's easy to search. If I search for Telnet, And you see there that Telnet, this is on, as you can see, version 12. So it's the latest version. Um, it still includes a Telnet program, so it st still gets installed. So in theory, if I did have um, LFS version 12 on that box, in theory, I should be, still be able to connect and use Telnet on there. Um, 
so yeah so what i'm going to do um as i say is to ssh from this modern machine it's debian 12 it's up to date ssh into the p pro machine which has got lfs8 on it and then from there i'm going to um, telnet from that machine to the um, pentium 233 mmx machine that i'm going to build linux from scratch 1.0 on so i'm effectively tunneling through um, you could argue I'm tunneling through the P Pro machine, P Pro 200, to get to the um, Pentium MMX machine to get the work done. So I'll start by doing SSH to P Pro, P Pro 200, and I'll log on to that. And then from there, what I need to do is to telnet to P233. And there's the SUS Linux 6.1 prompt, and it's asking me to log in. So again, I can just type in my details, and I'm into the remote machine. And if I do, okay, so LSCPU, not even that exists back in 1999. So I'll have to resort to CAT. CPU info, and there you can see I'm on the machine with um, a Pentium MMX at 233 megahertz. And if I do free, you can see it's got approximately 64k of memory, and I've got there's there's the 128 megabytes of swap space. But as I'm not, I didn't monitor it, but I'm not even sure this old GCC would would use. Um, the full amount of six, that 64 meg. I'm not sure I might monitor, try and monitor it this time, um, but I don't think that will even be touched. Okay, so the first thing we've got to do, uh, even before we go on to the, well, let's actually let's go into the book because it might lead us along. So let's go into the introduction. So there's a bit of history there, which is kind of, um, it's not exactly the same, history but you get the background it's in, fa in fact the more modern description of how this project came about looks like somebody's asked Gerard to do an introduction to the project and that's what appears in the modern Linux from scratches um, it's di quite different um, to what you see here um, so this is obviously a bit more of a personal comment on how it was started so obviously a lot of these links, well, they're not going to work or very unlikely to work because they're all HTTP and I doubt if these links work anyway. And you can see here's the first time we see that this is actually version one and the date December 16th, 1999. It's December the 14th today, so it's not quite the 24th anniversary, but um, I'm sure by the time it will finish uh, compiling this, it probably will be probably the 16th, I imagine. So let's go to next. Here's a list of all the packages that you need to download. So as I said before, there's no specifications as to what the host Linux should um, be able to support in terms of version numbers. And as you can see, there's also certainly no um, specification of what versions are required to build Linux from scratch 1.0 using this method. The exceptions being to that is glibc has got to be 2.0.7 pre-6 and the two GCCs that are used as part of the installation and the, there's an explanation later on of why there's two GCC versions. Um, and as I said in my first video, I think it was my first video, um, won't be installing some of these pa packages, especially the email ones, uh, there's very little point. Um, not going to be emailing anybody or anything. Um, relays have been locked down now, just you know, random relays. You can't just connect and start sending emails around the um, internet as you could do once before. So it's pretty pointless. So what I will be doing after, of, basically once we get to uh, probably about here, I will be installing links, but well before this point. Um, yeah, once we get to about here or so, that's more or less, in fact, 
Uh, it's probably to here actually. I'll be installing Netkit Base and Tools and Telnet, but out of order just purely so I can get remote access after the initial LFS system has been built. But effectively up to that point is where um, Linux from scratch is complete, especially from a modern point of view. It's a basic system. It's got all the tools, the tool chain, all the utilities for compiling and building other packages. Um, there's no real need to go any further. But what we'll do at the end is just to skip forward to here and build these last few packages to get a graphical environment up and running um, with the window maker uh, window environment. Uh, just to show that, well, I guess just to make it a bit more complete um, as far as the uh, first Linux from scratch is concerned. So that's all the package. So we've still got to get them and I'll show you how I dealt with them. How you deal with that yourself, um, really leave that up to you. There's obviously several options. You could do what I've done, have um, your own personal web server where you can copy the files to. And obviously a personal web server, you haven't got to worry about certificates or anything, which is a good thing because this browser on here, um, I think we've got links installed. I hope we have. Right, okay, yes we have, but um, I'll show you how to deal with that error in a moment. Um, yeah, it, it can't handle secure connections, so by having a personal browser without a secure connection, it makes it easy, you can just go on there and download, or maybe even use wget, I'm not even sure if wget's installed, no it isn't. Um, alternatively, you could get all the packages together, write them to a CD-ROM, and assuming you have installed from CD-ROM, which um, is probably the by far the easiest method, um, then you could just mount that CD-ROM and just copy the files or just directly extract the tarballs from that CD-ROM. Um, that's assuming you didn't need to use a CD-ROM for anything else during the installation, but that could be an option, especially for your Titan space. You could save um, you know, nearly 100 megabytes of space if you are uh, type for space uh, that's an alternate method of doing it um, you could have you could of course use floppies but um, as I say the total uh, size of the packages I, th I think it's about 100 megabytes or so as I remember and we can check that when I've um, obtained them all um, that's obviously going to take quite a number of floppy disks. I mean, 100 megabytes is probably about 80 floppies. So that's a lot of time. That probably takes several hours to to write each floppy. And even if you had a couple of floppies and alternating them, you've still got to wait for the floppy to write and then the floppy to read. And then that could be like a minute each, each operation like that, at least. So it'd probably take quite a bit of time. So... Um, you could possibly use a USB, although I th I don't think the kernel... I mean, USB was introduced around 95, 96 or so, um, and I don't think the kernel that comes with SU 6.1 is capable of USB. I don't remember seeing it when, we when I configured the kernel, which is obviously slightly newer, but still version 2.2. Um, when I was configuring it for Linux 1.0, um, so that's probably not an option, um, unless, of course, you used uh, another CD, a li another live CD that would boot on the old hardware that would enable the USB um, uh, USB ports. You could install an older copy of Windows and maybe get the... Um, you know, maybe have a drive that's FAT32 or FAT16 even, copy them to there, and that would allow SUSE to read that. Um, SUSE would be able to read that partition. So there are various options, and maybe just need sitting down and thinking about um, how, you, how you achieve that to get these files. As I say, a lot of these, well, in fact, all of them um, that I downloaded, all were off uh, HTTPS protocol links so there's no way i could have downloaded them directly onto the uh, su 6.1 machine that just wouldn't have worked 
Um, so you need to come up with some other method to get them onto the machine. So, um, yeah, I guess what I need to do is probably to fetch these files is the next thing. So what I'm going to do is to go to, well, originally, I'll probably do it the same. What I did originally, I created a directory called sources, just as we do in the modern um, Linuxes. Oh, of course, I'm going to have to be root for all the sessions, actually. So what I might do is just uh, log out of this and log back in but log in as the root um, there's no concept of having like a linux or an lfs user okay looks like i can't just yeah it's not allowing a root login so i will have to log in as the ordinary user and then su to root Okay, so now I'm root. Um, yes, yeah, so um, what was I saying? Yes, what I'll have to do is download all the packages from my server. Um, as I say, I've copied them there, I've transferred them. I downloaded them on, you know, I can't remember what machine it was, but say it could be in this one, I've got Debian 12, downloaded them on there. I then um, transferred them across over well I used rsync uh, but you could use scp um, onto the ppro server my local server and then obviously like I say from there I can serve them up um, on an unsecure um, web port uh, port 80. So uh, what we need to do next is to if you remember I created a partition HDA6 for uh, Linux from scratch 1.0, um, but I can't remember if that got formatted. I think I told it not to format it because it looked like SUSE was going to install or try to install itself onto there, even though I designated HDA5 as the root directory. Uh, again, that's one of the quirks of the installation of SUSE. So what I need to do is format that partition. So if I have a look at slash dev slash HDA, um, you can see that there it is there. Um, that's the partition that we want to mount. And what I need to do is to make a mount LFS directory. And I need to mount it there. So this probably won't work because I think I set it not to format. So yes, must specify the file system type. It doesn't recognize it. So I'm going to format that now. So I'm going to use um, uh, E2MK, E2FS, slash dev, slash HDA6. And that will format the partition as an ext2. And something to bear in mind is that we're currently using tools in SUSE 6.1. And as I said before, I'm not sure if SUSE supports ext3, does it? No, it doesn't. It's only got an ext2 extension. But the tools we install on um, LFS1... Um, I believe ext3 is supported. So you've got to bear in mind that you're creating an older file system here. So if that creates any issues, that, that is something to keep at the back of your mind. Um, that although we've been installing uh, LFS with all the latest tools, the tools we've used to create them haven't been the latest. So in pro possibly missing out, it might have been better to um, create the file system with, with ext3, but we haven't got that. Um, the opportunity to do that at the moment because there's, there's just no support. Okay, so now I should be able to recall that command and mount the file system. And yes, it has, has mounted. So what I'm going to do now is to edit the FS tab to make sure that's mounted each time I reboot so I don't have to worry about mounting that. 
So I'll edit that and I'll just add it to the bottom here slash dev slash HDA six and it's going to be mounted on MNT LFS. It's an EXT2 and we'll mount that with defaults and I'll give it the same parameters as the boot I think. In fact, I'll put that, I think you'll put a three in there. So in theory if I now unmount MNT LFS that should work. Yep, it's not mounted and likewise if I mount it there it is that's mounted so that should automatically mount every time I start the machine or reboot the machine you can see we've got 1.8 gigabytes available that's more than enough more than we'll ever need so that's all sorted um, so the next thing I'm going to do which does get a mention uh, probably on the next page or two is something you'll recognize is the LFS environment variable so at the moment LFS points to nothing and we need to have an environment variable that points to our root um, root directory so MNT LFS so now if I echo LFS you can see it points to the partition where we're going to build the system so I also want to make that permanent so what I'm going to do is edit the profile in my home directory so this is the roots home directory and just add export um, lfs equals slash mnt slash lfs and again that's so that i don't have to um, remember or risk forgetting to set it and start installing stuff into the system the su 61 6.1 system which will potentially trash everything because everything we're going to be doing is done as root so in theory if I now log out and log back in as root do echo dollar LFS yep that's set um, and as a final test what I'll do is I'll reboot I'll wait for the machine to reboot And when that's done, um, I'll log back in again and I'll just make sure that A, that the partition where Linux from scratch 1.0 has been mounted automatically, and secondly, that the $LFS environment variable has been set. So I'm just waiting, it's just rebooted now, here will beep in a minute. And then we'll just have to wait for the uh, SUS. There's the beep, so it started booting now. So it's loading the kernel. And just give it a chance. So while that's going, let's have a look at the next page. Okay, so it's talking about creating a partition, which we've done. Creating an ext file, ext2 file system on the new partition. And it tells you how to do it. It mentions $LFS there. Um, it doesn't suggest really where to put it, but it suggests um, if we're using HDA4 to put it on MNT HDA4. So that's how it was done there. Um, and then it says, you know, if it tells you to copy $FS user bin, that actually means MNT HJ4 user bin. It doesn't really matter what LFS is set to, as long as it's consistent and doesn't change throughout the build. That's the important thing. It's whether it suits you. I've just used MNT LFS because that's what it's always been for me since I started building from version 4 or so. So that's loaded. So I'm going to turn it back in. So log in. Become root again. So if I do df minus h, there's the mnt lfs. 
and echo dollar LFS and that's been set as well so it's all good so the next thing we need to do is add an entry to the Lilo so as I said previously in the previous video throughout the build it suggests that you attempt to reboot and it's quite good it's a bit more effort but it's quite good to see how the system's built up from virtually nothing um, we start augmenting it by um, you know building a kernel building you know some basic packages and so on uh, which is something you don't really get to see in the more modern Linux from scratches so let's edit the etc lilo.conf so this is the configuration file for the Linux loader and what we need to do is to basically copy what it's got here so it says image equals and we need to give it um, the already existing kernel image file so all we need to do is copy the existing image file that we've booted from and now interestingly it doesn't use spaces between the equals and yet this configuration file does use spaces so what I'm going to do is just to mimic what this configuration file uses then we need a label so we give it a name and we can refer to it as that so I'm going to call it LFS-1.0 and the next thing is root is $LFS so we can't just put in root $LFS because that's meaningless to Lilo. Lilo won't know what LFS is. We need to explicitly put the value of LFS. Um, although that's not made plain here. And this is what I said uh, in the first video that it's not, uh, the instructions are not as, um, uh, how do I word it? They're not as explicit as modern Linux scratches are where it says, uh, do this, that, that, that. Uh, you have to interpret what you're doing a lot of the time, and this is the case where you do have to interpret what's what's on the screen. Dollar FS just, as I say, would mean nothing to uh, Lilo. So what we need to put in here is the actual value that LFS is set to, which is MNT LFS. And then finally, we need to set this read-only, which I imagine tells it to... Um, mount the file systems read only. Um, does it say here? No, it doesn't. Okay, so that's just just check that image, and it's the same boot image we're using to boot SU six dot one label. That's just an arbitrary name that we give the boot option. The root is the MNT LFS and read only as I, say, I think that means the file system will be mounted read only so that we don't trash anything so i'll save that now it says to run lilo to update the bootloader so let's do that and you can see the program still defaults to the su system it's still got the dos that we added um, uh, but now we've got a brand new option LFS-1.0 when I go to show you the uh, booting of the screen um, we'll see that as an additional option so now it tells us to um, oh sorry that's I'm not sure if this is wrong actually. That should actually be the device, not the mount point. So that should be slash dev slash HDA6. So that's the root of the um, the file systems so as you can see hda5 is the root of the su 6.1 system um, and so our new lfs 1.0 system the root will be dev hda6 so again that's quite misleading actually it's probably because he's used the device name um, see the device is dev hda4 he's used the hda4 part to mount the mnt 
But even if that value was LFS, it's still wrong because MNT is meaningless. Um, so it's not quite accurate. And there are a few discrepancies throughout the documentation that you need to really reinterpret uh, and understand what's really uh, required. You can't take uh, everything at face value in this document. So let's save that. Let's run Lilo again. And Lilo is quite an unusual beast in that with Grub it sort of can handle file systems. Um, so when it looks for the kernel, it will it, it understands the the file system the kernel stored on, and it just treats it as if to, if it was a file on a file system. With Lilo, it actually stores the um, I'm not sure if it's the blocks or the cylinders, the sectors. It stores very low level information about the locations of the files, so it effectively knows nothing about the uh, file system at all. So it does mean that if you make any changes, you have to remember to run Lilo after each change, else either the machine won't boot or you'll run into some sort of trouble. So it's quite important to remember to do that. But um, I think this is there's probably only one other time that we need to modify uh, Lilo. So the next thing we need to do is to create the directories. So let's change into the Linux from scratch directory. And as I say normally on Linux from scratch videos, you can copy and paste all these commands, but you've got to be very careful to look out for errors. So what I suggest again or recommend is just to copy and paste these commands one at a time just to make sure that nothing's going wrong and also read what you're pasting in because as we've seen already you can't just willy nilly copy stuff and expect it to work um, so you've got to understand what's going on and just ensure that it's sane what's happening so you can see we're make, creating some basic directories here creating some man page directories uh, and creating some links which look like they're to the local file system or the um, base file system. So it says, as you see, the LFS system on the user local directory points to user. I'm aware that this is in violation with the FHS, but my idea is that user local directory doesn't apply on a completely self-built system since every software package is installed locally anyway and there's no part installed by a vendor cd-rom or something similar it's a good argument therefore i chose to make user local and user one in the same directory so nothing wrong with that also user etc and user var point to etc and var this is just another of my preferences copying the dev directory we can create every single file that we need to be in the lfs dev directory using the mknod command but that just takes a lot of time I chose to just simply copy the current dev directory to the LFS partition. Use this command to copy the entire directory while preserving original rights, symlinks, and ownership rights. So, again, there's nothing wrong with that. I seem to remember from my early LFS days there was a script that will create these, but it's, as it says, it did seem to take some time, as I remember. Um, so, let's run this. And in case you're wondering, these are the devices, the nodes that are under the dev directory in modern Linuxes. This is all done magically by UDEV, I believe. Um, in previous days, they're all static files that had to exist to allow uh, the kernel access to the hardware devices. So that's all done. So we should have um, stuff in lfs slash dev let's just check that and there they all are there may be stuff in there that we'll never use but it doesn't matter 